let's talk about the instrumental side of you for a minute. Um, I don't know if you remember, but maybe four or five years ago, I did a panel having four daughters. Uh, I, I can't say that I'm like, I don't go out and pick it, you know, for like, feminist issues, but I have four daughters and I want them to be self-sufficient, carve their own path in life. And I get quietly frustrated when a female taxi member will, you know, will reach out and say, oh, they love this. They want to put it in something, but they need a mix without the clavinet in it or whatever. And a female member will say, well, I can't do that till my husband gets home from a business trip. It's like, I do not get why it is that men have been so much more attracted to learning the technical side of how to run a studio, which you clearly have sitting behind you. Uh, yes. And I'm always very proud of, of the female members that it's like, what's the difference? Doesn't matter what your anatomy is, mm -hmm. you know? Um, <laughs> how, how did you learn how to engineer and produce uh, to the point where you are totally self-contained and very competent uh, at, doing stuff that's not a, a vocal collaborative but instrumental mm -hmm. stuff where'd you learn yeah. i mean first of all i i i feel like maybe there's just quite a bit of fear that's been like you know passed down from generations where women just didn't do this or that, you know, and, and seeing that it's always been very male dominated. Um, I don't know. I feel like when I, when I work with other female artists and I'm like showing them how to do vocal comping or something like that. And I, I see like deer in the headlights, look in their eyes and it's just not that hard. You just have to like get <laughs> over that fear. You know, I think that's, that's the big thing. It's just taking that step. And then, then, repetition you know like the more the more you do it the easier it gets and on the instrumental side I mostly do hip-hop and tension and there's formulas I mean tension you could argue might be the easiest one but there's like a variety of tension you can do hip-hop there's four you know there's there's um a formula and uh okay building a beat you know like once I know, like this, this always hits here. This is something you can play with. Um, it's it, it's totally doable. I I have learned a lot through YouTube. <laughs> you can learn so much on YouTube. Um, for example, with the hip hop stuff, there's an awesome guy named. Am I allowed to say that kind of thing? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a guy whose moniker is I'm a music mogul. I've seen that. Yeah. Name? Yeah, he's a great teacher. And I've learned so much about producing hip hop from his channel. Like, that's it. <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's as simple as that. Watch a tutorial and then do it. <laughs> so yeah, YouTube. And then of course, again, with relationships, I'll ask people that I work with, hey, how did you do that to my voice? That sounds so cool. Like, what's, what's the chain? What's the, proce what's the processing? Um, and yeah you know like mastering like uh, just just i'll ask questions with the people yeah. i work with and they're usually very very generous with their sharing that knowledge and sometimes i've paid people too sometimes i've paid some of my collaborators like you killed this how do i do that show me and we'll like schedule an hour session where i get to record it on zoom or something so i can go back and watch and remember everything and it's like it's always worth it but you know, yeah definitely knowing the people who can help you and who are good teachers Sometimes, yeah. sometimes people like are so good at something, but they don't know how to like share it. So it's finding those people who can communicate it well too. It's a real uh, teaching is a skill that some people mm -hmm. have, some people don't. Um, yeah. yeah, I've always been a little bewildered by the lack of equality. I hope I'm using the word in the right context here, but like with graphics, I think there are many, many more women who are involved in using computers for graphics, which is pretty analogous to like using Pro Tools or Logic or whatever, you know, DAW you mm -hmm. use. I mean, it, it's no less scary and no more scary. Um, yeah. it, it's a matter of watching tutorials and practice makes perfect. And I'm just mm -hmm. constantly befuddled by the fact that more women and I, I uh, 
somebody you and I both know, C.K. Barlow, she and I have talked about this fairly extensively, and she said, you know, it, it is an old hand-me-down that it was a boys' club in the past. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would argue, I have argued that a little bit with her because back when I was coming up in my 20s, there were female engineers working in major studios. They weren't treated mm -hmm. as females, they were treated as mm -hmm. engineers. Didn't matter mm -hmm. what your body parts were, it mattered how hard you worked and how talented you were and if you were figuring out cool stuff or not. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I hope that you inspire because uh, more women of any age to just like get over that thing that says, oh, this isn't something that girls should do or something girls can do. That's mm -hmm. BS uh, and, mm -hmm. and you're proof of that. So yay for you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. CK is CK is amazing. Like, and she she's one of those people who, you know, like she she's fierce and and she's she's like her brain, you know, like she loves to like play with sounds and experiment with creating new new sounds to to sample and stuff. Like she 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 is one of the people that I have reached out to for help in the past. And she's yeah, one of those people who's a great teacher as well as doing a great job with what she does. Um, I love CK. I, you know, it, it's such an honor as, as the owner of a business that so many of our members have become friends of mine. And, and I love the fact that I can pick up phone and call so-called customers, you know, mm -hmm. which I would think of as customers. But yeah, I just spoke to her the other day for the first time in probably uh, nine months or something. And mm -hmm. every time I speak with her, I'm amazed by her focus. Uh, I mean, she's chaotic and yet focused <laughs> at the same time, but brings so much energy and passion to everything that she wants to tackle or learn about. And it's like, it's infectious. I hope, you know, that. Mm -hmm. Clearly, she rubs off on pretty much everybody she meets. Yeah, yeah. She um, does. Let's talk more about the singing thing. Um, you taught a class at the Road Rally last year. What was the class about, and how did it go? Yes, it was called Vocals for Film and TV, and it was specifically about um, singing for sync versus for an album or for a performance. Um, because it is going to, there are some, there are some, again, formulas, like as far as if I'm singing for my YouTube channel or for my, for singing the national anthem in front of a ball game or something, that is different from what you'd be doing for film and TV. How so? Give us a, a, a little <laughs> bit of the class and tell us. Yeah, honestly, I, I would clearly know, having been in the industry for so long, that yeah, there's a whole different set of rules or, or chops for singing live versus singing in the studio or singing yes. folk versus singing, you know, Billy yes. Idol. Uh, which mm -hmm. still, I'm, this is my big takeaway today is that you love Billy <laughs> Idol. Um, I really never thought about it until you mentioned it pre Road Rally last year. What are the differences between singing, you know, just for a record and singing uh, for sync? Um, specifically, like when I think, you know, it's all subjective. I always have to say that too. Um, but my observations have been general trends. So I think when you're like, especially when you're a singer, like not just not just a recording artist, but when you're like a singer, a professional singer, let's say, you're very focused on showing off, kind of like, look at my skills, look how high I can sing, listen to this riff, listen to this power in my voice. And a lot of those things are distracting to picture. Uh, if you're like way up there in the stratosphere, singing, you know, whistle tones, or just run after run after run, which is so impressive to listen to, but it's distracting from what you're seeing on TV. And unless it's like a feature placement, like the end credits or something, they won't want to use it. But, you know, I feel like what they do want is this authentic sounding voice. So it's about having a compelling tone. It's about having compelling storytelling. And it's about enhancing the mood of the mood or the scene. Mm -hmm. So 
it's very, you know, there's, there has to be expression, there has to be emotion, um, but you could sacrifice technique and training to create those sounds. So like when you're like singing the national anthem, for example, like you, this is your big moment. It's a hard song. Like you got to nail that high note. Like it's very technically oriented as well as like, um, like I said, a moment to show off. And then for film and TV, it's really not about you. It's about the scene. So how do you enhance the scene with your song? And you don't, you won't even necessarily know like what you're writing for, but as long as you're communicating emotion and expression and something compelling to listen to uh, without being distracting, that's, that's the sweet spot. I'm, I'm impressed because back when I still worked in the studio, um, I considered myself a pretty good vocal producer. I don't know if other people did, but I certainly liked me. But I always said uh, I would clear out the room and it, a lot of times it'd just be me and the vocalist and I would turn down the lights in the control room so they could barely see me and I would like bathe them in a blue light, light a few candles out in the room. Tell them, sing it from, let it go from your toes to your heart and out of your mouth. <laughs> They want to hear you and they want to be moved. They're not looking for chops. They're looking for relatability and make me cry or yes. make me laugh or make me mm -hmm. feel joy. How totally. do you do that? Um, I mean, it's a combination of technical craft and mental craft where I guess mm -hmm. you're becoming like an actor. Well, how does that act, actor, actress, what is, how do you tell your brain, make me sound authentic or make me sound mm -hmm. really concerned or make me sound really heartbroken? How do you do that? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I can't sing. So tell us. Yeah. That. Well, I, I, I do feel like there is just a willing, you have to be willing to experiment and try something different. And every take you do, try to give it a little bit of different uh, nuance and interpretation. So maybe you phrase it differently. Maybe you take a breath in a different spot. Maybe you slide at the end of a, a phrase with your voice, go down or um, squeak or uh, give a little fry sound or um, iron out the vibrato. There's, there's lots of ways you can experiment with the delivery um, so that it sounds more emotional. Frank Sinatra may be one of the greatest um, examples of being able to do that of all time. Just uh, I go back now as a, an experienced set of ears, which I didn't have when he was a thing when I was in my teens, probably. He uh, he made you feel like he lived the story and was mm -hmm. and you were his best friend coming along for the ride. And I've always been amazed. It's like. Does he think about that? Is he plotting a strategy or is it just a natural <laughs> gift? But that's quite a, a, a thing for vocalists. And that's, you know, people are always saying in the sync industry, especially in the last two or three years, more emphasis on the word authenticity. They're looking for <laughs> authentic sounding artists versus people that sound like they're manufacturing music for sync. Yes. So, um, mm -hmm. Hats off to you for figuring out how to deliver that authenticity in a way that makes it appealing to the, the people who are the end users in sync. Um, any good vocal tips in general for people? We have a fair number of members every year that say, geez, I'd love to submit to this, but I'm just not a good singer. And I think for this kind of thing, you don't really need to be a great singer. You need to sound like you're telling the story from an authentic place. Totally. Uh, any just general singing tips or how do you approach that, you know? I totally agree. And I'm glad you brought up that point too, because that was like part of like my my description for the taxi panel last, the, the taxi class last year was um, just, you don't need to be a great singer to get a sing. Um, it is, it is about the storytelling and it is about the authenticity. And you might not have a huge range, for example, but you've got this gravelly voice or something that just works for like this bar scene or whatever it is. That's all you need, that and Melodyne. Because if you're not <laughs> a great singer, like, but you have a cool tone, maybe you're a little pitchy. So just, just make sure the pitch is good. And again, there's exceptions to that too. Sometimes they might want it to be a little rougher, like a little less perfect sounding, but yeah. generally 
that pitch has got to be good. And so just, just clean up those little notes, but keep that voice, you know, like there's, there's a place for so many different voices in the world of sync. And one of the examples I used in my class was this song called Tire Swing by Kimya Dawson. It was in Juno. She's got this like very, I would call it like a basic voice. Like there's nothing, you know, it's, it's a plain voice. It sounds untrained. It sounds raw. It sounds relatable. That was a word you used. That's like so on. Like, because these characters were relatable. They weren't mm -hmm. like the high school cheer cheerleader and the jock. It was like just normal kids. So they needed like this voice that was just like, it could have been one of them singing, you know? And, and I think at one point in the film they do, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So don't let that hold you back. Like it might work. Um, it, yeah, and context too. Like, okay, if you don't have a great voice and you're trying to do a power ballad, maybe hand that one off to more of a singer. But if you're just, you know, acoustic, folky kind of thing, that might work great in the voice you have already. Um, Melodyne, uh, kind of like nuclear energy. It has some good <laughs> uses and it has some evil uses or people who use it not to great effect. Um, how long did it take you to learn how to use it judiciously and to not like over perfect? Um, it's an easy program, first of all. It's very user friendly and it, yeah, it just, I don't know, like to really, really feel comfortable with it cumulatively, maybe it took me two weeks. <laughs> I mean, but he, I was like, you know, you can, you can do a song in like an hour or two, like first try out. Yeah. Um, so I, I like to, it takes way more time, but I like to go note by note looking at it and listening and not tweak every, you know, not like auto correct everything across the board. I like to just correct the notes that are definitely a little too far out of where they should be. So yeah, um, I think Melanine, like, unless you just like slide everything to the extreme, it has a very natural sound. So I like to just do it by hand, even though it takes a little more time that way. For my background vocals, I will usually just like, slide the pitch to about like 80% and um, the, the center of the pitch, I'll slide that out to like 80%. And then I'll just check and make sure that nothing got moved too far. Uh, but usually, yeah, for my background vocals, I'm a little lazier with it, but for my lead vocal, I want it to sound natural. I want it to sound real. And um, so I'll just, just do those little subtle touches. Let's talk about background vocals. We might be the first people ever to talk about background vocals. It's an underserved aspect okay. of making music, um, especially when you're a, a home bound artist producer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Back in my day in prehistoric times, um, we were always <laughs> very careful to not use the lead singer as the background vocalist, but sometimes in a pinch, that's all you got, you know, and, and you don't want to, mm -hmm finished the sessions without having backgrounds. So I always had to, it, there was a struggle to not have the background sound like more of the lead. Do you have mm -hmm. any advice on how to accomplish that where you don't want to sound like, oh, there's six Juliets singing <laughs> Juliet? Yeah. Um, yes, I, again, it, it, it kind of depends on the context because there's a lot of stacked vocals now where it's, it's okay to be six Juliets. <laughs> Thank but, you, Billie um, Eilish. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Um, in that case, like 20, no. Right. But uh, I do absolutely play with my tone on the background vocals. Usually I use a much breathier tone for the backgrounds. Um, but sometimes if it's like a, a high energy moment in the song, I will, like literally play with the air pressure of, of how I'm singing it. So I might do a really strong kind of more rock sound on one part and then a little more subdued one on the second part. And then like um, a fuller, richer, heavier voice on the third one. And then like a, a higher sound on like the fifth one. So I, so it, it sounds, sounds like, like a natural group, a group rather than yeah, yeah. robots of you. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Cool. Yeah. Um, so it'll either be like a, I'll play with those tones or I'll just do all of them like really breathy and light so that they sound like background vocals as opposed yeah. to my lead. <clears throat> um, someday, because we don't live that far from each other now, uh, or you don't live that far from this office, but I got a hold of the 16 track two inch master tape of the Eagles, Take It Easy. It was found in a dumpster outside of Olympia Studios in London. And oh my, my assistant gosh. called me, I was in a meeting somewhere. My assistant called and said, you're not gonna believe what I just saw online for sale. I said, it, there's no way that that can be authentic. And if it is, it's probably, the tape is probably destroyed from being 40 years old. But you know what? I, I, I grew up in the industry. The Eagles were recording under the same roof I worked at every day. And I knew them personally and got oh, to cool. occasionally stick my nose in their sessions for like the, um, one of these nights album in Hotel California. Oh, so I said, I will spend up to $500, even though I think I've got no hope of getting that for $500. Mm -hmm. He got it for $70. It was shipped here from the UK. I gave it wow. to a friend of mine who worked at Capitol Studios. He baked it, bounced it to digital, and I've got a digital version on my laptop of that. Wow. Being a vocalist, sometime you got to come over to the office and listen to the Eagles singing on Take It, was it Take It Easy? I think it was, yeah. Um, uh. In the studio with Glenn Johns engineering and producing, um, their harmonies are so effortless. And, and talk about they didn't need melodyne. They didn't, yeah. it's basically just, it's, and I think that they got that good because they were Linda Ronstadt's backup band for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and they just played a lot live. And I've heard this from other vocalists that there is no better thing that you can do to prep yourself for being a great singer than sing live because it just hours invested 10,000 hour rule, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and the Eagles really show that. So someday you got to come over. We'll, or uh, we'll I am in. so taking you up on that. Absolutely. Okay. I will not let you forget that. <laughs> Please do. I, I pull it out like three or four times a year. I've got some killer um, control room monitors now mounted on my desk in the office. And I listen to it on that. Sometimes I'll be here at like nine o'clock at night by myself and just crank it up and listen. It's like, damn, it's just perfect, you know? That's so cool. That is so cool. I mean, Rob Chirelli, like those classes that he has done in the past at, at the rally where he'll play these isolated vocals and stuff. It has, it always blows my mind to hear the isolated vocals. Um, Cause again, you can really hear the nuances yeah. of, of what they're doing. Like, um, yeah, one that really stuck out on me that it was uh, Pour Some Sugar On Me by Def Leppard. Oh yeah. <laughs> it was hysterical hearing his, his vocal isolated because it was so effective. His style is so effective, but it works so well for that song. Like, Context it, is study. everything. Uh, yeah. A story I often tell, and I don't want to make this all about my studio stories, but um, a friend of mine engineered the song Celebration for Cool and the Gang, which was cool. a huge hit. Still gets tons yes. of, of airplay and gets weddings every out. day. <laughs> yeah, every day. Um, and he made me a 24 track to 24 track, uh, one generation down copy of that and sent it to me. And I remember my assistant and I, one night after we finished work, we put it up on the machine and we start bringing up each fader individually. Each fader was like horrifyingly bad. And, and I looked at my assistant and said, this guy is like, you know, a top 10% engineer. I can't believe his stuff sounds this bad. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing was when you shoved everything up to zero and just panned it either left, center or right, and threw mm -hmm. just like a little bit of reverb on the stuff that should have reverb, it sounded like the finished record. So mm -hmm. context really does matter. You, you can't all, yes. if you strive for perfection with an isolated thing, everything else suffers because of that. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I continue to be challenged on, on the engineering side is because when I hear something isolated with a big cut in the, EQ, in the EQ, especially a vocal, I'll be like, no, I like that. But then when you hear it sitting so much better in, in the broad than the full mix, you're like, oh, I get it. But I'm still like learning to, to take those little leaps of faith, like cut there, there's a reason, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have a, a favorite vocal mic and do you use the same mic almost all the time or do you, <laughs> is that a road? It sure is. I know. Yeah. I, I love it when people, 
people know their mics. Um, oh my it's nothing super. Fancy. Yeah, of course, you're an engineer. You should know. But um, it's nothing super fancy. But I really like um, the way my voice sounds going through that particular microphone. I've tried some other ones, and that's the one I keep going back to, even though it's a little more sibilant than I would like it to be. But I'm willing to do some work um, on the sibilance afterwards, just because I like the sound of this mic so much. I mean, of course, I still want to try more, but this is my workhorse. <laughs> yeah, I could. Uh, some people like to watch sports on television. I would be happy to sit in a, a dark room with the speakers turned up pretty loud, um, trying out different microphones on different things. I could do that all day yeah. long, every day. It'd be a very That's happy cool. camper. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. what's your, what do you use for your vocal chain? What do you use for compression? Where do you land on EQ? That sort of stuff. <clears throat> Gosh, <clears throat> I have a chain that I <clears throat> have been using for so long that I'd actually have to like pull it up and look at exactly where everything is on it. Um, but again, like not to make this a, a big old taxi commercial, but okay, <laughs> I've been, I've been a taxi. <clears throat> member for 19 years i looked it up this morning 19 well okay i started 19 years ago last couple years i've lapsed but <laughs> um i learned my my chain from watching a taxi tv that you did years back with rob shirelli and he's ah. he actually like kind of gave it away he's like here's what i like to do and i wrote it down like i did that exactly i love the way i sound on that chain so that's the one i do um if you're watching this and you want to know, because I, I would have to pull it up, so feel free to DM me and I'll give it to you. But um, yeah, there's like there's like a little EQ and it's very subtle. I can tell you that I remember it's just like a little boost, you know, maybe like I want to say somewhere between one and two K maybe, right. and then like a little little cut lower down. But it's pretty subtle. And then compression, pretty pretty mild compression. I'm I don't you know I don't. I am, but I don't have a huge voice. Like I definitely belt, but my belt sounds different from like Lady Gaga's belt, for example, okay. or Jennifer Hudson, you know, and even more like she's got a huge voice. Yeah, she so. could blow the control room glass out of the frame with that. Voice. Totally. <laughs> yes. Yes. Or is it like someone like Ariana Grande? She belts. She's got a great mixed voice, but it's not going to sound huge. So it's, I'm more on that side. So yeah, compression and then uh got a limiter after that and then a, I love to record with a little reverb most of the time yeah I just 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 so I can hear that of course I don't have a I always have a, a dry vocal to to send off to whoever I recently but while I'm recording uh what what's your reverb uh do you remember what your preferred reverb is? not the settings but which plug-in yeah I it's it's an oldie too that's like this shows you how far away how long ago this taxi tv was but um i'm using uh it's i use logic as my DAW, and it's one of their legacy it was like um platinum it's called platinum so I'm so that's away. again i i didn't you know i never engineered anything in the digital domain i always worked in like ssls or neves and two inch tape mm -hmm. but maybe two or three years ago i I had to get a new laptop and got it ordered it with logic on there and i love logic although i rarely get the time to use it as much as i would like mm -hmm. blown away by how mm -hmm. much stuff there is and how good the stock plugins sound and how good even some of the stock instruments sound mm -hmm. um but the about a month ago i saw somebody in a youtube video that mentioned reverb uh, crystalline um mm -hmm. i can't remember something baby i can't remember is the company but the if you google <laughs> crystalline reverb anyway i went and watched more reviews of it i didn't need another reverb because i just don't get that much time to do it but i love great mm -hmm. sounding stuff and i am a reverb mm -hmm. nut. and i've got to tell you whatever i paid for it i think it was 79 bucks it is for my money so far the best sounding digital reverb the most usable Ooh. you know some of them you really have to search you really have to mm -hmm. kind of understand the physics of reverb and mm -hmm. how to get them to sound good you can barely screw anything up with this it's very intuitive and it just sounds so 
rich for lack of a better word. So check that out. It's, okay, uh, I will. I will yeah. check that out. Yes, I, I love a good reverb too. <laughs> I use <laughs> Valhalla sometimes, like they have some fun ones. But yeah, especially, again, it's just depending on like what I'm recording. If it's an ethereal vocal, I need a reverb, <laughs> you know, like lots of it while I'm recording because it makes me sing differently when I have that sound. So I'm able to tap into that style more when I've got my wash of reverb. So I, I'll definitely have to check out Crystalline. <laughs> I, I have been known to freak out an artist or two back in the day when I still worked in the studio where I would give them more reverb in their headphones while they're singing the vocal to inspire them because it does. It's yeah. Awesome. Everything sounds better with verb on it. Uh, mm -hmm. But then they'd come back in the control room, you know, they'd go hit the men's room, come in for a listen and go, what happened? What happened? Because I <laughs> got to give as much in the playback in the control room right. as I was in the camp. And they're like, like I sound like crap. <laughs> <laughs> no, you sound mm -hmm. fine here. And, you know, just turn up, send one and there's more reverb. Oh, great. Now I sound beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> vocal. Uh, exercises that you recommend kind of generally for all vocalists do you have a, a regimen of like what you do before you start a session or do you like go chain uh, chain smoke a pack of marlboro reds what's your deal <laughs> <laughs> no 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 that's bad <laughs> um yeah it's kind of amazing actually how some some singers are like total smokers and they've got amazing voices <laughs> It's like, well, quit, quit while you're ahead because it won't last forever. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple like bang for your buck vocal exercises that I'm just such a fan of. And the big one is the semi occluded vocal tract exercises, Say which is, <laughs> yeah, it's semi S S O V T, semi occluded vocal tract. So wow. there's a little bit of blockage, basically. Um, like if you're singing through a straw or if you're doing a lip buzz, that's, okay. that's, it's creating a little more back pressure and it just helps you sing more efficiently. It kind of trains your vocal cords to sing more efficiently, hmm. the less strain and stuff like that. So, you know, like in a pinch too, you can, you don't need a piano. You can just be doing slides um, from the bottom of your range to the top of your range and back down again through a straw into a glass of water, especially that's my favorite kind. Wow. Um, it's really, really good for you. And it's a great vocal cool down too. If you've been doing a live gig and your voice is tired, then that's a cool, you can cool down with something like that. But I have found too, like this is totally against what any good vocal coach should tell you. But I have found that sometimes it's helpful not to warm up. Like I will just get out of bed and hit record sometimes in the morning. Because again, there's just something a little different about my voice that might work better for what I'm recording that day. Um, like more of a quirky sound, more intimate sound. I'm tired, you know, I'm just like, uh. and, and you can hear that in a, like, in a favorable way. So unless, unless I'm gonna be doing some belting in my upper register where I really should warm up, I, I usually don't warm up because I just like to hit record. And sometimes those first couple takes, I'm like, yes, that was the one. So. I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, I've worked I don't know, probably two, three, four thousand hours in the studio with Neil Young in the late 70s. Wow. And one day, very early on, um, I think it was the Comes a Time album, it was just Neil, myself, and my assistant. And he literally looked at me through the glass, kind of glared at me through the glass like he was pissed off about something. And he put down his guitar and he got out of the chair, came in the control room, and he said, Look, you spend way too much time worrying about your compressor and your EQ <laughs> and reverb. He said, forget that stuff. He said, just give me a look through the glass. Like, cause there wasn't a producer on the mm -hmm. session, self-producing. So I can't mm -hmm. kind of became a de facto producer at like 26 years old with him. He would wow. look through the glass and I had to give him a nod like that. Take mm -hmm. felt like you, you know, there was authenticity yeah. with Neil all over that. And that was a moment in my life where I learned maybe the single most valuable thing I've ever learned working in the studio, which is screw the technical stuff. And, and I don't mean just the limiter or compressor or EQ, mm -hmm. whatever, even looking at a vocal from a technical standpoint. OK, so you blow a note or, or something's a little pitchy, but the mm -hmm. performance, the emotion yeah. was so compelling. Mm -hmm. Worry about yeah. that other stuff later. So do you? Mm -hmm. 
how do you um, teach people to not overthink it, not oversing it, where people are on like take 22, they probably got it better on the warm up take. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely found that for me too. Like, when it, you know, for the most part, there's every now and then there's a phrase that just kills me. I'm like, that wasn't it, that wasn't it. And I'll, I'll end up with like 20 takes. But most of the time, six to eight is my sweet spot. I, I know people who do less than that even. But um, like usually six is like a really good number for me. Um, yeah, I just, I, I think it's really important to get out of your head. And we, in the music business, we have to self-critique. We have to judge. We have to, because, you know, it's a competitive place. And we have to constantly be questioning, is this good enough? And is this reaching the bar? And so it's easy to constantly be in this place of judgment. Like when you're singing, like, oh no, that was terrible. Uh, just stop and, and start again. No, 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 keep going. Just give it, give it time. You, you never know how it's gonna sound on the playback. Sometimes I will be thinking that was terrible, but I'll keep going. And then I'll listen and be like, ooh, actually, <laughs> that's probably where my voice cracked. That's actually really what this song is called for. Pretty singing isn't, isn't it for this song. Mm. Like that voice crack, I'll keep that. So, um, yeah, I think it's a matter of just getting out of your head and stepping away from judgment and critique and just tapping in to the music, connecting with the music. Sometimes maybe it's closing your eyes or moving a hand or something. Or like you said, if it's candles, I used to wear high heels every time I recorded. Because <laughs> really? it just put me like, yeah, I just felt more confident, I'm taller. <laughs> um, so I, you know, whatever, like little uh, tricks in that, if that helps, like. That's great inside right. information right there. It's like, you know, as long <laughs> as I've been in the industry, as many hours as I've spent working on projects uh, in my lifetime, I've never known anybody that put on heels to sing, but it makes sense. You know, yeah. somebody once, I think it's probably my dad taught me, you know, if, if you dress, dress up a little for work, you'll, you'll mm -hmm. be a little more on, on your game. Yeah. Yeah, because I sit here with jeans the whole holes in. <laughs> <laughs> but music work, that's the that's the uniform. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. this has been nothing short of, of delightful. I love hanging out with you. Um, you too. You are authentic, and it really comes <laughs> across in your personality. And thank you for being generous with everything that you've learned about the industry. And please remind me, um, probably. August June uh, oh. road rally. Uh, I think oh, yes. we'll come back and teach that class again for the road rally. Um, I'd love to. So yeah, we would love to have you back. And congratulations just on being fearless and figuring it all out and all the great placements and stuff. Uh, I think you're inspiring. I hope uh, other people who watch this find it as inspiring as I did doing the interview with you. Thank you, Juliet. Thank Thank you, Michael. And just, just before we hang up, I just want to thank you. You know, like you, you have a generous spirit. You are giving, like you are so committed to the community, uh, to, to the music industry. And um, I'm grateful to know you and I'm grateful to Taxi. And it's been, like I said earlier, like I can trace so much of my success and so many of my friendships to directly to taxi so thank you thank you thank you <laughs> you're so welcome i'm glad that you've used all that we offer so well and i'm proud of you and grateful to have you as part of the family thank you <laughs> <laughs>